So um, the video is powerful. The video demonstrates a true Christian life when you live it the right way. Because a true Christian life, when you live it the right way, is pain, it's suffering, it's hardships. But he had a choice to have it easy by not doing anything and sitting still. But as he fought to live the life and walk, who was in his ear? The coach. The coach was in his ear pushing him until he reached that end zone. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 23. As I said before, as you see these videos, we got to think spiritually as well, too. Because this correlates biblically in many ways, as we're going to study out in the scriptures, amen? In Luke chapter 23, in verse 26. The Bible says in verse 26, it says, as they led him away, they see Simon from Cyrene, who's on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now, the Bible makes it very clear. This is Jesus right after he's been beaten, after he'd been bruised, the crown of thorns have been put on his head, and now they carry him and they say, hey, you got to have a 110-pound cross and carry it to the place where you're going to be executed. At this point, Jesus was beaten upon. He was spit upon. The crowd was against Jesus. But now he has to carry a 110-pound cross. Jesus carried a 110-pound cross on his back in the front. While Simon, who was coming in, who was visiting because of the Passover, carried it behind him as well, too. So it wasn't just Jesus carrying the cross. It was also Simon as well, too. They carried it together. And the distance that they carried it was 300 yards. That's three football fields. So imagine that guy going three football fields and going further. I would say he was maxed out, amen? But Jesus went 300 yards and he pushed himself to go. You know, the title of the lesson today is Discipling 300 Yards and Beyond. Discipling 300 Yards and Beyond. You know, Jesus humbled himself to, be a, to allow another man to help him carry his cross. Guys, you have to understand that this is God in the flesh humbling himself and says, hey, I'm going to allow this guy who's shouting in for the Passover to help me carry my cross so that I can be executed. Jesus had every right. He could have prayed for God to give him more strength and the angel would have came and strengthened him according to Luke chapter 22, verse 43. But he humbled himself so much to no point he allowed this man to help him carry his cross for 300 yards. Matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, the Bible says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He, made, he was being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. To this day, you cannot fully grasp this passage right here. The Bible says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. You know what that means? When Jesus walked around, he wasn't like, I'm God, I'm God, listen to me, obey me. The Bible says he became nothing. And he became even obedient to death on a cross. That's how radical Jesus was to Christianity. Are you that radical today? You know, the cross represents death. It represents suffering. It represents persecution. All in all Christianity. My question to you is that if you were Jesus in Jesus' shoes, would you allow Simon to help you? You know, as men, we love to do things on our own. Yeah. I got it. Don't leave me alone. Back up. I got it. But yet the cross is crushing you. And other brothers are trying to help you, but you say, no, I got it. I can carry my own cross. I don't need you. I don't need the church. But we need to understand that God has made us to be dependent upon him and need each other to get to heaven. You need the brother that's sitting next to you. We all need each other to make it to heaven. This is a heavy cross that we're carrying, guys. 
And without each other, we're not going to make it. But Jesus had deep convictions on discipling. Do you have deep convictions on discipling, my brothers? Do you have deep convictions? It's like discipling will help me get to heaven. Or you think that you can do it on your own. You know, Jesus was so humble that he even got open with the men that he was with before he went on the cross. What, that, that makes no sense to me. God, in all, he, he, had, he, he didn't have to be open with his guys. He, he, he didn't. He could just went to the cross. But he got open with them on the way he was feeling. Jesus had deep convictions on discipling. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. The Bible says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I command you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We know that this is Jesus' last words, and this is the resurrected Jesus speaking. And he's not giving a suggestion to the disciples. He's giving a command. He says, go make disciples of all nations. Then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. You know, that word teaching is not once. It's ongoing. So let's say you're over five years as a disciple. Well, I'm five years now. I don't need discipling, right? No, you will make it to a disciple. You still need discipling. Amen. I don't care if you're 80 years old. You need discipling. No matter what age you are, you need another man in your life to help you and point you back to God. Are you guys with me? This means that everyone needs discipling. No one is obsolete. It is not mature to think you don't need discipling anymore. You know, for me, I get discipled by Jared. Locally, I, I talk to Chris. Chris helps me with my heart. I talk to Alfonso. He helps me with my heart. I understand I need discipling as well, too, locally, and also by Jared as well. I need discipling. Yep. Everybody in church needs discipling. I don't care how old you are. Right. If you have something on your face, sometimes you don't know it's on your face. You need somebody to point it out and say, hey, bro, something's on your face. Amen. That's what discipling is for. Amen. We all need it. Are we humble to the men God put in our lives? Are we dipping and dodging discipling and running from it? And say, man, he can't help me because he doesn't understand me. That's what we say. My brothers, we need to get in a place where we are in the need of discipling so brothers can help us and we can help them as well too. Amen? You know, Jesus was a master discipler. Let's look at John chapter 1. You know, in our discipling, we got to imitate the way Jesus discipled. He's powerful in how he discipled. Amen? In John chapter 1, verse 35, of course, Jesus had just been baptized. And John the Baptist baptized him. But two disciples lead John the Baptist to follow Jesus. And in verse 35, the Bible says this. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they, they uh, heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turn around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. You know, it's a powerful passage. And we see that two disciples were like, wow, this is the Lamb of God, so I'm going to follow Jesus. They're like, good luck, John. I'm out of here. And then they follow Jesus. And we realize from pastors, it's John and Andrew that follow Jesus. So as they follow Jesus, Jesus turns around to them and says, hey, what do you want? And that's always a question we got to ask ourselves. What do we want? What do we really want from Jesus? Do you want money and possessions? Or do we want a girlfriend? Or do we want to follow him because we love God and we want to be with him for eternity? What do we want when it comes to following Jesus? But the Bible says they spent the whole day with him. You know, what's interesting to know is that Jesus was the busiest man to ever walked this earth. 
Nobody was as busy as Jesus. But the Bible says he took the whole day and spent time with the disciples. They seen where he lived. They seen his life. And they're inspired by that. You know, discipling is about sacrificing time for each other. Knowing each other's lives. Jesus was not secret about his life. He actually showed the disciples where he was staying. He's like, hey, this is where I'm staying. And I can imagine it being a very nice place. Neat, in order. I don't, I don't imagine Jesus having a messy place and <laughs> being undisciplined. Uh, uh, take a seat over there. It's all this stuff on the couch and all this other stuff. No, Jesus was disciplined. But it shows you that he showed them their lives, his life. We got to show each other our lives and not be secret about our lives. Bro, how's it going? Who you been talking to? What do you mean, how's it going? Who you been talking to? What, why, why you want to know where I live? Like, we become like the good fellas and stuff like that. Like, man, well, who you been talking to? Guys, we, got, we can't be secret about our lives, amen? Let's keep going to verse 40. The Bible says in verse 40. The Bible says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. What's your translate? It's Peter. You know, Andrew was so moved by the time he spent with Jesus. That he's like, man, I, I got to go get my brother. So he goes, and the first thing he did was get his brother Simon. Jesus immediately saw Simon when he spoke to Simon. And he spoke who Simon will be. He spoke into existence. He says, you are Peter, which means rock, stability. Now, did Jesus know that Peter would, you know, deny him three times in the future? But Jesus didn't see him as he was then. He saw him as he, who he will be. Are you guys with me? You know, discipling should be inspiring. We should be believing in those we disciple. We should be believing in them more than we believe in ourselves. That's how deep we need to be in discipling. We're believing them to that point. Keep reading in verse 43. The Bible says in verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before the Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. You know, Nathaniel criticized Jesus. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Jesus knew that he criticized him. But Jesus didn't get all flustered. He didn't get angry and upset. He didn't fight back. How are you going to say I'm fine? You didn't say that about me. But he still loved him, and he focused on helping him become who he needed to be. See, that's what discipling is about. It's not about us being our emotions. It's not about us feeling not respected. It's about us giving to the brother that's in our lives to help them no matter what's going on. You know, Jesus believed in discipling. I pray that you believe in discipling as well, too. And I truly believe that we have a discipling issue in the church. A lot of us don't have convictions on discipling. Discipling is a command of God, according to Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. It's not a suggestion. We are called to be in each other's lives. Are you guys with me? It is a command of God. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, he called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. 
You know, at this point, Jesus was sending his apostles out to go preach the word of God. And what we find is that Simon was the leader because the Bible says he was first. Now, it doesn't mean that he was first in the one that Jesus reached out to because we realize that Andrew was the first one before Simon. Is that he led the apostles. That's why he was the leader of the apostles. But notice Jesus, he put them in pairs. Two are better than one. Jesus knew two is better than one. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. But if you check out these men, although all these men were different, they were still paired together. You got Thomas, a serious Jew, and then you have Matthew, a tax collector. Do you know how much the Jews hated tax collectors during those times, guys? The tax collectors were sellouts. That's what they were. They sold their people out, and they were stealing money from their own people. But yet, Jesus was a master at discipling, and he paired these two together. They're, they're the complete opposites. And he was like, hey, you guys are going to be together and go out and preach. And guys, think about this. They were going to go out and preach, and they'll be gone for months, and then they'll come back to Jesus. So Thomas had to get along with Matthew because if he did it, they'll be at each other's throats. Are you guys with me? And then you had Simon the Zealot, who was fighting the Roman governor at one time with Judas Iscariot. I can't imagine how the disciple times were during that time. How's it going, Judas? Oh, everything's fine. Judas, everything good with your heart? Oh, everything's good. Oh, you know, I sang a song today. Oh, the Lord bless me. Amen. I can't imagine Judas being open with his sin, amen, at all. Playing a part, being an actor. Look at me, I'm giving to God. But yet you're living in sin in your life. See, sometimes we complain about not relating to our discipling partners, yet differences are good. Differences are good. Even in marriage, differences are good. Ain't that right, Brock? If Brock just got married, differences are good, Amen. Because the husband could be weak in something, but the wife can be strong in something. But what does that do? It makes you complete. Amen? <laughs> or the wife may be weak in something, and the husband is strong in something. What does it do? It makes you complete. It's the same in our discipling relationships. You may be strong in one area, more stronger than you're the person that's in your life. But yet, he's strong in the area that you're weak in. And guess what? With both of you together, it makes it complete. And God can work powerfully in that discipling relationship. You know, throughout the word of God and the gospel, Jesus discipled his men on unity. He discipled them on conviction. He discipled them on giving. He discipled them on love. He discipled them on sacrifice. He even discipled them on biblical knowledge as well, too. See, Jesus believed wholeheartedly in discipling. We look at two places where Jesus discipled. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 33. In Mark chapter 8. Well, actually, let's pick it up in verse 31. The Bible says, He then began to teach them that the Son of uh, Man must suffer in many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, a cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. You know, at this very point, Jesus was speaking to his disciples saying, hey, I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. But Peter was so bold, he was like, no, that would never happen to you. And he rebuked Jesus. You know, for me, when I think about that, I can't imagine the thoughts that was going through Jesus' mind. Now, remember, Jesus never sinned, so he wasn't critical. At, well, Peter did. But Jesus looked at his disciples. Then, of course, he looked at Peter. 
And then he says, get behind me, Satan. In your mind, it's not the things of God, but it's the things of men. But then he turns to his disciples, and then he says this. If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So what we find from this passage is that, of course, Peter cared about Jesus. Of course, he loved Jesus. Of course, he didn't want Jesus to get hurt. But deep down, Peter didn't want to live as a disciple. And Jesus was discipling every one of his disciples. If you're going to follow me, you got to deny yourself. you got to carry your cross. you got to die to yourself. Guys, it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. you got to give up your life so you can save it. But if you try to keep your life, you're going to lose it. Jesus was preaching radical Christianity. And he was calling him to live it out. You know, Jesus used this as an opportunity to preach the word of God. You know, calling us to be radical. You know, it's very easy to be lukewarm in our discipleship and do the bare minimum. Some of us who've been around for a long time, we know how to do the bare minimum. Amen? Yeah. Give your contribution. You come out. I was there. I, I came out to all the means in the body, right? We know, we know how. <laughs> come on, you, you know, you know how to do it. I can, I can, I can easily do blending. I can just sit in and everybody think I'm doing well, but I'm not doing well. Amen? Right, I can do the basis of Christianity. Mm. But what, what, what does God call from us? He calls us to lay down our lives. See, if a seed does not die, it will not produce many seeds. A seed must die to produce many seeds. And we got to follow Jesus with all of our hearts and give everything we have to him. Another thing that Jesus discipled, his disciples on, look at Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. You know, what gets me about this passage is clearly in verse 41. The Bible says Jesus sat down opposite the place where offerings were being put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. So what Jesus did not, only he see the actions. He saw the heart of each individual that put money into the temple treasury. See, Jesus understands the inside-out religion, amen? Christianity is not about cleaning yourself on the outside. It's about cleaning yourself on the inside, and then the outside will be clean. It's called the inside-out religion. But these men put in large amounts. But then Jesus sees his poor widow. Poor. All she had was two small coins. That's it. Worth only a fraction of a penny. And you know what? In common sense, why would she give up all she had to live up, live on? Why would she give that up? And why didn't Jesus stop her from doing that as well, too? Jesus could have easily been like, hey, that's, that's it. That's your last. Just keep it. Keep it. Don't give it. But Jesus was trying to show the disciples on how to be all in. Either you're all in or you're not in at all. Amen. And she gave everything. She put it all on the line. Imagine if you only had $10 and you're like, hey, I'm giving it away. You know how much fear that be going through your mind? How am I going to eat? How am I going to live? She trusted in God so much that she sacrificed everything she had. And that was the heart of this widow. And Jesus used that to teach his disciples. He was teaching the disciples to be generous. See, it's not about the amount. It's about the heart. It's always about the heart. See, when disciples don't give, it's not about financial situation. It's always about the heart. Always, guys. There's something wrong with something that's going on in the disciples' heart when they don't give. You know, sadly, as a church, I think we need to have a deeper conviction on giving. A deeper conviction. There's brothers, probably even in this room, that consistently don't give week after week. And I'm like, it's not a money thing. I'm more concerned with your heart towards God. 
Where is your heart towards God when it comes to giving? See, giving is part of discipleship. It's laying down our lives for Jesus. Are you guys with me? And right here, this poor widow put in all she had to live on. You know, heart condition, and I believe it's a lack of discipline as well, too. We have to teach each other that giving is part of discipleship. You know, so what's the purpose of discipling? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. What's the purpose of discipling? But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, it says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, the purpose of discipling is to grow and mature. You know, if my son, you know, he's nine years old, he's almost my height, already at nine years old. That's not much to say. I mean, but but if my son stayed the same height and he's 20 years old, I'll be deeply concerned. I'll be like, what's going on with my son? Why isn't he growing? We have to think the same way when it comes to spiritually. We cannot be stunted spiritually. All of us are called to grow and to grow, t- grow tall as well, too. You know, what's funny is that if you are friendly and unconfrontational, people will like you, but they'll never love you. People want to change, and they want someone who will help them change as well, too. Because we all are called to be teachers of the word of God. We all are called to get in somebody's life and share with them the scriptures and help them to become disciples. No, we are called to speak the truth in love, and people will feel it's mean, but they will thank you in the end as well. You know, throughout my uh, time of being a disciple, I remember all the people who disciple me. Um, the first one was a brother named Herb. Come on, Herb. Um, yeah. Know, yeah, you know Herb? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I didn't like Herb at first. I really didn't. I'll be honest with you guys. I didn't like him, you know? He also, he, he used to always be around. I was like, oh, bro, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. I'm like, hey, Herb, just let me breathe, guys. I don't, I'm trying to live as a disciple, right? But even through the flaws, because a lot of ways, you know, disciple was a little, you know, it was like petty and stuff and like little things. He, he was discipling like little things I would do. But even through all that, he taught me truly about life and doctrine. See, there was a point in time where I was like, when I first became a disciple, I was like, yes, I'm a disciple. Forget school. Guys, I felt all my exams that week. That week, I felt all of them. But he was like, hey, bro, life and doctrine. See, no one's going to respect you if you don't have the right doctrine. And especially no one's going to respect you if you don't have the right life. You need to be an example so you can impact people on your campus. And that's what I remember from her. You know, it's another brother. His name is Kofi. And Kofi was mad. He was was probably one of the most radical brothers I've met. I mean, in one semester, guys, he he, he reached out to 13 of his friends, and 13 of them got baptized. Just one semester. It It was crazy. He was like an evangelistic machine. And what he taught me is that, man, you got to have a heart for the lost. You got to care for people more than you care about yourself. And you got to be about God's mission. And then there was Matt. And Matt was awesome in my life because not one time I ever heard Matt like yell at me or say anything disrespectful to me. He always kept his composure even when I went off on him sometimes as well too. Sometimes I was angry. I was like, Matt, dude, you don't understand. But a lot of times I was being disrespectful. But never once, I never seen him yell or disrespect me. He was always calm. He always used the scriptures. And he also challenged me from the word of God. You know, what he taught me was living my destiny. See, during those times, you know, full time, I wasn't thinking about being a minister. That wasn't my, my heart. And, and it wasn't like Matt was trying to be like, oh, OJ, go into ministry, go into ministry. No, he allowed me to play it out. and allowed me to see from my life what I really wanted. And he inspired me to live the life and the destiny that God had for me in my life. You know, do you appreciate the person that's in your life today? Are you grateful for them? Or are you critical about the person that's discipling you? You know, sometimes we got to see the good in people and what they're bringing to us. And we got to listen to what somebody is saying to us. 
Now, some of us, even if Jesus was disciple, you still would have listened. <laughs> you know, I, I ain't listen. Ah, no, nah, this, this got to be the right. But guys, God, God is on your side. He's trying to help you. Yeah. And he's trying to help you grow. Come on. Several of you brothers have helped me without even knowing it. I will have conversations with you guys. I'm like, hey, he got a point there. I got, this is something I got to grow in, you know. And I appreciate that because I can learn from you guys as well, too. But we got to humble ourselves because we can learn from anyone. I don't care if somebody is a weak old disciple. You can learn from him. And you can grow from that disciple because he walks with God. Are you guys with me? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. You know, what's funny is it's crazy because a lot of people think the church leaders are here to change the church, which is true as well. We're here to work with the church. But the church disciples the church leader as well. The church disciples the church leader. Guys, I get discipled by you. You guys teach me. You train me. And you help me. It's vice versa. Amen? Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. It says, let's pick it up verse 14. It says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. What's the point of discipling? To stop others from falling away. What are the reasons why people fall away? Undealt with bitter roots. And you know what's funny? Followers produce more followers. Because why? They poison other people. Happens a lot biblically. Happened many different times biblically. But ah, man, it, it can be very subtle as well. He's like, ah, you know, yeah, you know, those brothers, man, those churches, like, don't, don't deal with them, man. I, I don't like how they talk to me. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they do talk to me kind of bad. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to listen to you. Oh, no, what? I'm a follower. I'm out of here, man. He's right. But what he said, followers produce more followers. Why do people fall away? Number one, it could be the love of money. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Kingdom is not first. Matthew 6, verse 33. Someone can say, man, it's too much commitment. Or we can be like the religious world where we just come on Sundays. Yeah, God calls us to be committed. Amen? Amen. I mean, there's even some brothers that are not here today. Are we going to give them a call and say, bro, is everything okay? Why wasn't you at midweek? That's discipling, guys. There were times when I missed midweek and brothers called me just to check on seeing how I was doing. And I appreciated that because it held me accountable. So I could be committed and walking with God. Cowardice, never evangelizing it. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Or maybe lust, leading to sexual sin. Matthew 5, verse 27 to 30. Or maybe even laziness. You know, several different things that we can wrestle through as brothers. All of us wrestle through it. But we need other brothers to help point it out. Not in a judgmental way, amen, because, you know, obviously we all sin here, right? (laughs) But to be like, hey, bro, let me help you with something. Amen? So right now, we're going to talk about the seven practicals of a great discipling relationship. Seven practicals of great discipling relationships. Practical number one is love. John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. Love one another as I have loved you. How much did Jesus love us? He laid down his lives for us. See, Jesus never intended for us to have super, superficial relationships. Where it's high and by, hey, bro, we get, we're on the surface. No, he wants us to go deep. He wants us to be family. But that will not happen without love. Love binds us together. And Are you guys with me? We got to get to know who and what you're dealing with in each disciple relationship. It's not just about these, you know, these, these routine questions that we ask the brothers, like, how you doing spiritually? Where, where, where you been? <laughs> it's to get to know their life. What's their job? What's their weekly schedule? Where do they live? Have you been to their house? See, that's what discipling is all about, is getting each other's lives and having a true love. Number two is get time every week. Get time every week. Now, is that a command in the Bible? No, it's not. But the command is discipling, amen? (laughs) But discipling, it has to be consistent. Every week, get time. Now, for those that who disciple people, do you have a conviction to reach out to the person so you can disciple and have a discipling time? 
And those who are getting discipled, are you going to disciple or are you running from discipling? Like Jonah. Oh, I don't, I, wow, how you doing, bro? I'm out of here. You running, you running. You running quickly away from discipling. We cannot run from discipling. If you have discipling, you got to get it. Amen? You got to go get discipling and get the help that you need. You know, I have a set time weekly. Um, and no constant discipling, guys. That is nagging. You know what I mean? That's what I heard, you know, used to do at times. It's like, it's like, you don't know what to do now. You're like, oh, I don't want to spell anything. <laughs> Disciple patterns rather than situations. That makes sense? Amen. Disciple patterns rather than situations. There could be a lot of situations that you see, but you don't got to point out every single thing. It's patterns, amen? Because patterns is what can really take a person out and they can fall away when it becomes a pattern in their life, Amen? Look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17. Come on, bro. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 17, is that the Bible says the first to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. You know, this scripture is very good for married discipling. It's good. Because what we find often in marriage discipline is that, all right, I hear from the husband, yeah, how can she do that? This is wrong. But then you hear from the wife, it's a completely different story. You're like, oh, wait, hold on. Wait, wait, oh, who, who's right here? Who's, who's right in this situation? And Mary's are laughing. They know what I'm talking about. Amen. <laughs> because we can have a story in our head and like, hey, this is what happened. But a wife can have a completely different story. So married couples, it's very important that they get discipled together. Amen. So you can hear both sides, amen? And not just one-sided, and then now you're attacking the wife because, oh, this is something she did. But all along, it was the husband. It wasn't, it wasn't even the wife. But it's what the husband perceived, and he's like, this is how it went, amen? amen. But our marriages need to focus on loving God first before each other. Amen. And I truly believe there can be a radical transformation in our marriage ministry. A radical transformation in our marriage ministry. You guys ever seen uh, Married uh, with Children? Yeah. <laughs> Al Bundy is on the couch, and he's like, honey, give me something to eat. And all you see Al Bundy do is watching TV, drinking a beer, <laughs> eating food. That's not the married life that God wants us to have, amen? The married life that God wants us to have is like a Priscilla and Aquila. Do you realize that is the only exemplary uh, 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 marriage in the book of Acts that they show? The other one wasn't exemplary. It was Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. <laughs> so, what, so what does that tell you on how God wants marriages to be? God wants marriages to be on fire for him. Just because you're married doesn't mean you can't be sold out like a campus student or a single. Now, it may look different. It will look different. Amen. <laughs> you're not on campus like these campus guys and, you know, sharing with 100,000 people a day. But yet the conviction should be the same, guys, for a married couple a single, and a campus person. A disciple's conviction is a disciple's conviction. It should be no differences. So I want to call the Marys. It's time for radicalness. It is time to be an example in the church. Amen? And live the destiny that God has called us to live. Number three, we got to make it spiritual. Look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. Disciple, we got to make it spiritual. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. He says, a fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinions. You know, if you're in discipling time and the word of God is not being used, that's not discipling. That's just, you know, counseling. It's like, you know, Dr. Phil, you know, give you your, <laughs> let me tell you what you need. <laughs> but guys, discipling should, the Bible should be used. Why? Because Jesus was like a walking Bible. You got to have God in your discipling. And when the Bible is not used, how can God be in your discipling? How can somebody change? Amen? What we have to realize is that what changed us in the beginning? From being a drug user to being clean. The word of God. What changed us from being immoral to not immoral anymore? The word of God. So what makes us think anything else will change us now? The word of God is what changes us. So the word of God must be used. Praying together, evangelizing together. We got to show them Jesus in action. Now, what I really fight to do in my disciple relationships, 
for those I disciple, I fight hard to be an example. Because I don't want to create some in the box to the person I'm discipling. What I mean is this. I'm trying to teach this brother about something, but yet he doesn't see it in my own life. So he's like, he's getting critical. He's like, man, even though it's not right, but yet I'm leaving a door open for him to be critical because I'm not living the life. Just like me leading the church. I mean, <laughs> just imagine, you know, Dale will see me one day. I was coming out of a bar and I was stumbling. And I was like, all right, I'm going to see you at church, brother. <laughs> you think Dale's going to be like, yeah, go and preach the word. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, they will have a critical face. He's like, bro, I just seen the, the minister in a, in, a, in a bar drinking beer. Like, what is he doing? It's a stumbling block. Amen? So we have to have exemplary lives for those who disciple people. Amen? You got to show it in your life so that they can see the example. Are you guys with me? Number four, have something you are specifically working, specifically working on with that person and work on it until they change you know, the biggest thing that Jesus discipled his guys on, if you really uh, read the scriptures, is their faith. That's the biggest thing he discipled them on. Because everything derives from your faith. So that person you disciple, they should know what you're working on with them. And they should want you to help them overcome it. Amen? Number five is disciple to a vision. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, we could turn there. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, the Bible says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. You know, in um, uh, King James Version, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. See, when men don't have vision in their lives, they cast away. They die off. You know, what we saw in that video was a young man that was carrying another man a whole hundred yards of a football field. But what did you see? A coach that deeply inspired him. And then when he was done, he was like, man, I need you. He inspired him. I know it's just a movie, but we, we understand that guy was never the same again. He was different. Because we got to disciple one another to a vision. And the last one we're going to talk about, teach them to train themselves. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. The Bible says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Hold a promise for both the present life and the life to come. Training ourselves to be godly. See, if, if, if someone's constantly relying on a brother, oh, we're so-so, we're so-so. What happens when a brother goes out on a mission field? Disciples going to die because they fully relied on this brother. Now, of course, he needs the brother, amen? But we have to teach each other on how to train ourselves so that we can be sufficient enough to stay as a disciple whether or not the brother is around or not, amen? We got to teach ourselves to confess our sin regularly. Be open about where you're really at. Brothers, we go through emotions every single day. I go through emotions every day. And guys, I, I, I have to say, like, I have to be the one to confess a lot. I got to get open. Because sometimes I'm, I, I'm like, oh, let me just keep it in. No, it's nothing. Let me just keep it in. Then a week goes by, and then I'm all discouraged and stuff. I'm like, man, what happened to me? <laughs> because I wasn't confessing my sin. That's why. Are you truly open about where you're really at? That's training right there. You're training yourself to be godly. James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your sins to each other. And you get the help that you need. You know, a great example I like to use is Kobe Bryant. Come on, Kobe. Kobe was radical when it came to basketball. Yeah. So radical that the coaches did not have to push him. He pushed himself because yeah. he was motivated. There was one story where he was in the gym at 5 in the morning. The players came, and he was already drenched in sweat because he was working and pushing himself by himself because he wanted to train himself. Yeah. See, Phil Jackson didn't get it. You have to get him to do it. He had a motivation in his heart because he wanted to be great for God. We got to train ourselves to be godly, amen? You know, discipling, 300 yards and beyond. You know, what's special about the scripture with Jesus and Simon, the Cyrene, is this. Look at Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. The 
Bible says in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, it says a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander, and Rufus was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. And right here in the book of Mark, Mark mentions other names. He says the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, we need to understand that the gospel of Mark was written to the churches of the time. And so, most likely, the churches knew who Alexander and Rufus was. And that's why he says the father of Alexander and Rufus. But what we find here is quite amazing. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 13. In Romans chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible says in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. You know what's powerful about this passage and what we need to understand is that because Simon carried the cross with Jesus, what happened? His son also became a disciple as well too. See, discipling saves lives. It saves lives. So Simon didn't know years later that he'll have his son and he'll be a disciple in the church. Yet he carried a cross with Jesus 300 yards. But we got to do it 300 yards and beyond. And I believe we're at a very pivotal point in the church, a very pivotal point. I truly believe that God is calling us to go even higher when it comes to being great for him. But yeah, if we don't make a decision as men to go to the next level, who will? We are the men in the church that's going to take the church to the next level. Amen. But we all need to come together and understand why we do what we do. We do it because we love God. We want to honor Jesus. And we want many to make it to heaven. We got to make a decision today that we're not going to be lukewarm. No, we're going to be radical for Jesus. On, Whatever it takes so that more souls can be saved. And you know, I'm so grateful to have Aaron with us. And Aaron was wrestling in his faith to come back to God. But yet there's a thousand more people like Aaron that's out there that want to hear the word of God. Brandon back there, he became a disciple. 24-hour fitness. Many of you just became disciples this year. But I see many more that's going to make it because we believe in discipling and going 300 yards and beyond. My brother, it's time to take it to the next level. Love you guys. Thank you. Amen.